Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this conversation about patient-centered care related to diabetes in the eyes. I'm Jeff Todd, CEO of Prevent Blindness, the nation's leading volunteer eye health and safety organization dedicated to fighting blindness and saving sight. Today's panel will, dis will discuss how healthcare providers coordinate with people living with diabetes, how they communicate with each other and consider each patient's needs, along with leading providers from throughout the U.S. who care for individuals with diabetes, we'll also hear from someone living with the condition and the related eye disease. We'll discuss what patient-centered care is and why it's important in maintaining eye health. We'll learn about the different types of health care providers and supporting health professionals who care for people with diabetes and their eye health. And finally, we'll discuss how care coordination is important for overall health. Our thanks go to Regeneron, whose support made this webinar and the enduring education it will provide possible. This workshop will be recorded and made available on the Prevent Blindness website, and we'll take questions from the audience. We'll respond to as many as time allows. Please submit these through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, we encourage you to fill out the evaluation survey after this workshop is over. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists for this session. Tamika Nelson, Dr. Michael Barnett, Dr. Kristen Wanyanwu, Dr. Patricia Grant, and Dr. Susan Primo. Tamika Nelson is a patient financial representative at Caramont Health. She's also living with diabetes and its related eye disease. Tamika, would you please share a bit about yourself and your experience so far in caring for your diabetes and related eye conditions? Hello, everyone. My name is Tamika Nelson, as he stated, and I am a 41-year-old female living with diabetes. Um, I, I was first um, diagnosed with gestational diabetes um, with our first child, me and my husband's first child, and I didn't know that I had diabetes until I went to work for my current employer, Caremont Health, and they did a employee physical and I had sugar in my urine. And from that point on, um, I learned that I was living with type two diabetes. I started out with a um, A1C of maybe 12 and with different medications and correct eating and diet and exercise. Um, I got it down to a 5.3. Um, and then I began to experience um, vision loss. And when that happened, it just rocked my world completely. Um, been, been dealing with that now since 2020 and I've had two retina um, eye surgeries where my retina was detached from both eyes. And um, now I'm I'm back on the road to recovery with all of that and living life as a mother, as a wife, as a worker, still gainfully employed, working at a computer, but still managing to make do with my eyes the way they are for now. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I look forward to hearing more, more about your experience. Um, next, we have Dr. Barnett, a professor of health policy and management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a primary care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Barnett, would you please tell us a bit about yourself and your role in the care of people with diabetes? Great. Thanks, Jeff. And um, thank you for everyone um, for inviting me to this panel and everyone who's uh, participating today. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm on faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and I'm also, I also practice primary care. My research centers around um, understanding the relationship between primary and specialty care, um, and with a special interest in um, how do doctors communicate with one another, how can we better coordinate care, especially for patients who have multiple um, complex conditions, which is very much, uh, very much intersects with what we're talking about today. Um, um, you know, the role of the role of a PCP in diabetes care is complex and multifaceted. Um, but I view that, you know, our job is to really 
um, help patients navigate the many, many, many different steps and different providers that are in the healthcare system. And um, my research um, also centers on when that doesn't work out so well. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Wan Yang Wu is an ophthalmologist and retina specialist at Yale University. Dr. Wan Yang Wu, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do as a retina specialist for people living with diabetes? Sure. So um, I am a researcher and a retina surgeon. So a lot of my patients uh, have diabetes and we care for the impact of diabetes on the eye full spectrum um, all the way to the point where someone may need retina surgery with me. So I do everything from annual visits just to check things, make sure that things are okay with people that have no retinopathy to the intricate complicated surgeries of um, tractional retinal detachments and otherwise that come at the end state of the severe disease. And that's what I do clinically. Uh, from a research perspective, I am funded by the National Eye Institute for our sight saving engagement and evaluation in New Haven program, which aligns our patients based on our algorithms that are at highest risk for eye disease with the patient navigator that helps them manage social determinants of health and the intricacies of health systems in order to see if we can break the cycle of marginalized communities and low resource communities, um, shouldering much of the burden of blindness from diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Grant who works in diabetes research and education at the Chicago Lighthouse. Dr. Grant, would you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do in diabetes research and education? Sure. And, um... Thank you, and thank you for including me on this important discussion today. Um, so as you mentioned, I work at the Chicago Lighthouse, and that is an organization that provides services for people who are blind and visually impaired. Um, so the research that we do really focuses on advanced, advancing low vision rehabilitation, um, and that could be either through technologies or techniques. Um, and then we also work alongside low vision optometrists who work with patients to provide education and, about their eye condition and um, provide additional tools to help benefit them. Um, but what we are, you know, what we've seen is that so many of our patients are um, here because of diabetes. So we really wanted to start doing some prevention work. So we are doing primary prevention um, strategies now, and one of them includes a uh, lifestyle change program where we're working with people who are at high risk of uh, diabetes and helping them to make small but effective changes to their lives to either reduce um, you know, or eliminate the uh, risk of diabetes altogether or delay it from developing. Um, and then in addition, the optometrists are um, providing screening for patients who, have, um, who are either at risk or who also have diabetes. And this will help with eliminating uh, the progression or um, maybe slowing down through early detection and timely treatment. Thank you. And finally, we have Dr. Primo, who's a vision rehabilitation specialist at Emory. Dr. Primo, would you tell us a little bit about um, your role, your important role as a vision rehabilitation specialist? Good. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you much, so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Susan Primo, and I'm an optometrist by training. Um, I also have a master's degree in um, public health. And I did some of my training at the um, Eastern Blind Rehab Center um, at the VA, the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in West Haven, Connecticut. And that's where I really developed my passion for working with patients who unfortunately become visually impaired from hereditary eye diseases and conditions such as diabetic retinopathy. And so vision rehab spe specialists like myself do extensive evaluations um, to determine which devices and tools um, help a person with a vision impairment function at their highest level throughout the day for work, education, um, general activities of daily living skills like reading and writing and shopping and cooking, just to name a few. And we work with a team of professionals like occupational therapists, um, orientation mobility specialists and other therapists um, with expertise in vision impairment. And our goal is to really encourage people you know, living with vision loss to advocate for themselves and we help them find strategies to do so so that they can live a full and um, productive life. Thank you. And thanks again for all of you for, to all of you for joining us today. Um, Dr. Barnett, I'd like to circle back to you. Could you explain a bit about um, what patient-centered care is and what role you play as a primary care provider in, in it? Great. Thanks, Jeff. You know, this is a really important question um, because I think uh, patient-centered care is very much kind of a buzzword jargon that I think a lot of us hear if you 
read any hospital brochure or watch TV and see a commercial. Um, but um, you know, it actually has a very um, a very specific and sorry, it has a very specific and profound meaning um, that I think can really serve as a guide for how to pursue your own care. So one way that I think about patient-centered care is in terms of what it's not. And what patient-centered care is not, is it is not physician-centered care. So what that means is that what's important in the care that you receive is what is important to you as a person and your goals. So for some, you know, for some of my patients, controlling their blood pressure or controlling their blood sugar, it's it's really not what's important to them right now. Maybe they're they're just more important about making sure they can pay rent. And um, patients and doctor-centered care would be to simply offer that person, you know, some lab tests and say increase your insulin, and then just have them have them have them go off, and then I keep on keep on moving. So patient-centered care really is about the idea that the patient is the one who um, um, who dictates what what is important for the interaction and what will we accomplish together. Um, as a primary care doctor, I view my job as making sure that this happens and to fill gaps for providers who are not maybe so adept at providing patient-centered care, which is, you know, there are always going to be gaps in the system. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of illnesses um, that primary care that we manage by ourselves, um, but, you know, certainly managing, uh, in most cases, eye disease is really managed together with an ophthalmologist, but can be very, very important for us to coordinate with that provider and to make sure that um, um, our prioritization of what the patient wants to accomplish through their diabetes care and the importance of their uh, vision for their work um, and other social determinants of health is really, um, really reflects what the patient needs. Um, and not every PCP is going to think the same way that I do, um, but I think the vision for primary care that I think is really you know, been articulated by a lot of different scholars of, of healthcare um, in the past several decades is that ideally, um, you know, well-functioning primary care puts the patient at the center and helps them accomplish being the center of their care when the system doesn't work out very well or falls apart. Thank you. I really appreciate you calling out that too often we, we hear the words patient-centered care as kind of a throwaway and we need to give it more real attention, I think. Uh, Dr. Wanyu, would you um, please explain a little bit about what we're here to talk about today, diabetes-related eye disease. What is it and um, what impact may it have on the life of a person with diabetes? Sure, so um, diabetes-related eye disease is the impact of the inflammatory milieu that is caused by diabetes. So the increase in blood sugar actually causes a whole body inflammation. And what happens over time when you have that environment of inflammation, particularly when you have high blood, high blood sugar, it impacts actually the eye from front to back. And so today when we're talking about diabetic retinopathy, we, you know, you're gonna hear us talk about the bleeding that can come from it or the swelling, but it really impacts the entire eye, right? So our patients with diabetes diabetes get cataracts more frequently. They have more dry eye because of the nerves there as well. And so we're really talking about, you know, the full eye. And what happens is the blood vessels in the back of the eye are changed based on this environment. And it's this, this environment of inflammation that changes the cells in the eye. And you would think that the environment would cause the blood vessels to be tighter, but it actually causes them to leak. And so what that does is it pushes the blood and it pushes the swelling and the contents that are supposed to be inside the vessels out. And so that's what's called diabetic macular edema. And then also the hemorrhages. If you've ever looked at the back of an eye, you can see the bleeding that's there as well. I think something important that also we talk about that's at the more severe end is when abnormal blood vessels start to grow. And so the eye is formed around gel. And that gel is the vitreous. And this happens when you're being formed in the womb where you're forming everything else. And the back of that gel actually connects to the retina. So now we have to say, what is this retina? And it is a lining of 
neural tissue, brain tissue that actually connects the eye to the brain so that you can make sense of the pictures, right? And so how we describe it is a thin sheet and that is connected to the gel. Remember, we talked about that ball of gel that your eye is formed around. And when you have the environment of high blood sugars and inflammation, it causes these abnormal blood vessels to grow and they grow along the back of this gel. Now, I always say at this time where the only time you're supposed to grow new blood vessels in the eye is when you're growing the rest of your body. If you're ever having new blood vessels in the eye, it's never a good thing. It's not good in the front. It's not good in the back. And what those blood vessels do is they bleed and they break because they don't have the proper environment to exist and function. And so what can happen over time is that those blood vessels grow and then they bring the retina with it because the once they exist over time, they contract the retina and they can pull the retina off. And that's what we call tractional retinal detachment. That's what we call like the, the sight threatening version that we're really worried about. But we have great news. So nearly 40 years ago, we figured out what to do about this. So we have treatments for it. We know that if we screen that we can keep people from going blind. Now we have the advantage of new medications, anti-VEGF and otherwise. And most of the time, if we get people in the appropriate amount of time, even if you have changes related to diabetic eye disease, we can help you. And so, you know, what I would love to be able to share today with our um, viewership that has diabetes is that there's, there's hope and there's hope along the whole spectrum. So for those of you that are just, you know, getting your diagnosis, making sure that, you know, you set up all of these appointments, as Dr. Barnett said, there's a lot to do, but make sure that we keep eyes on that list. And um, because we, as long as we see you, we can keep you going. But then for those of you that may have had some challenges or may have had some vision loss, there's also hope there as well. And then hope for the future for us to be able to prevent some of these complications in the future. And so happy to chat more, but that's kind of my, my overview and, and how it impacts folks. Good. Thank you. We'll definitely be coming back to you. Um, Dr. Grant, um, we have a lot of members of the care team here represented today, but who else is part of the care team for the patient that we may not think of or, or we haven't discussed yet? Yeah, there are. It's, it's a lot. There are a lot of people that could uh, contribute to the care. So there's the medical team, so endocrinologist who is a specialized medical doctor who can uh, diagnose and treat the condition. Um, there are medical assistants and nurses and you know anyone who's helping you make your appointments. Um, there are also going to be people that you have regular con contact with and communication with, so you can consider them part of your team. Um, you may often see a general ophthalmologist, um, an optometrist, like we talked about today. There are diabetes coordinators. Um, there are also peer-to-peer -peer educators um, in the community that, that have great information that could, could work with patients. Um, and then there are, there are other people that we don't really think about as being part of the care team, but it could be um, transportation services. If you're someone who needs uh, transportation to your provider, um, those are people that you want to work with as well. And then, um, of course, your friends, your family members, I mean, they are the people who are in your life day to day, um, could influence you either in a positive or a negative way. So informing them about your condition and getting them on your team as an active member is also a great idea. Thank you. And Dr. Wan, you, we've talked a bit about patient-centered care. So how can that lead to better health outcomes for patients with diabetes? So it's important because like we talked about, there's so many things to do. And having the patient and the patient's goals, just like Dr. Barnett said, in the forefront of our minds when we try to think about what is the appropriate plan is really important. And in our work, we do a fair amount of participatory science, which we were actually discussing before this call, and that's elevating our patient voices and asking, you know, what are the important things, but also what do we need to do better as a care team? And I think care teams and really understanding the context in which our patients are trying to navigate the system and also the limitations of our system and how that we can work better to kind of knit a community of caregivers around as well. I think that's really important to be able to do that. And I think having a good relationship with your providers is great. And if you have an opportunity to find a different one, if you don't have that good relationship, I think that's also important as well, because you want to have someone that you can trust. You want to have someone that you tell the honest truth, um, even when it may not be what they want to hear, so that we can get you to your best eye health, your best vision. 
Yeah, and I guess as a follow up, you kind of touched on it, but but why is it so important for the eye doctor to be sharing information with the primary care doctor um, and vice versa? So it's really paramount for, you know, 30 years, we've known that if our patients have improved blood glucose control, we can decrease the likelihood that they'll experience blindness from diabetes. And that's really important, but also that's not something that eye care providers often manage. And so in partnership with our colleagues that manage blood sugars and help our patients to achieve their goals in the setting of what they're able to do is really, really important. You know, there are a lot of folks that are working on this. American Diabetes Association has a committee that's really trying to think about how we really do this well. We're running into challenges these days with technology, interoperability. A lot of my optometry colleagues and my ophthalmology private practices are on paper. And how do we get that into the EMR? And how do we get the EMR to talk to the other EMR? And the patient says, hey, look, I did what I was supposed to do. You guys have to pull it together. And we should. And so what does it look like to get all of that knitted together? For example, for my patients, I send a message right away and we have a lot of jargon in ophthalmology, lots of little terms, little acronyms, but my line says, this patient does not have retinopathy. I will see them in six months. I will see them in a year. I'm encouraged by their you know, glucose control Thanks. And I send a little snippet just so that we can make sure that we're very clear about what's happening. And then also my patients that need surgery or my patients that have lasers or injections, sometimes I see them more than their primary care doctors do. Our anti vegetative treatments are sometimes monthly. So you can imagine how much I know about my patients. I've diagnosed strokes before just because I talk to them so often and we talk about their social determinants and what's happening with them. And so me really communicating with their primary care that may only see them every three months is paramount. And I can tell them, hey, their machine for um, their glucometer doesn't talk to them. How can we find one of those? And knowing what's available from our low vision colleagues and knowing what's available for them to be able to pursue their best health in the setting of their current context is really important. And we just have to do a better job as a health system and as healthcare in general and figuring out how to do that for our patients with diabetes. And I love Dr. Primo's thoughts about self-determination as well. It's really important to be able to put up the structures or to introduce the resources for folks to be able to do things themselves and pursue what they think is the best. Thank you. I, I appreciate your comments uh, frustratingly about the EMR situation. I just switched providers and it was a, such a hassle to get my records from one to the other. Um, we can do better, as you said, in all of this. Um, Dr. Primo, as a vision rehabilitation specialist, you work with ophthalmologists and retina specialists. What can we do to make care more collaborative for patients living with diabetes-related eye disease? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, we are always developing strategies to educate our primary medical care providers, as well as families, on all the ways poor vision can affect managing diabetes. I mean, nobody really wants to talk too much about vision loss and poor vision, but we really have to, and we have to understand how vision loss affects people's quality of life, um, even in managing their diabetes from something as simple as, you know, the primary care provider telling them to go out and walk more or exercise more. But if you have vision loss, you may not be comfortable. You may not feel safe. You may be afraid that you're going to fall and things like that. Um, so we have to make sure that providers and others understand that. Um, even something like reading the medication bottles or drawing up the insulin syringe. I mean, these are all things that unfortunately can become difficult um, when you have vision loss. And so communicating to all providers, um, I think is important. Um, we also wanna encourage all providers should to have a list of resources available and their materials in their office should think about people who might have vision loss. Um, so it could be in large print um, and, and it should be accessible to people who are visually impaired. Um, when I do my evaluation um, at Emory, you know, we make sure that our questionnaire is in large print so people can see it because you can't fill it out, obviously, if you can't see it well. So I think thinking through ways of accomplishing this is important, things like tweaking electronic health records and so that they're accessible to people who may have vision impairment or vision loss, you know, patient portals. I mean, if you're telling the patient, we'll go in and just check, you know, what your last hemoglobin A1C was, but yet 
it's not accessible for somebody who has you know, vision impairment or even the brochures in the office, again, need to be in large print and need to be accessible. And then you know, we've even thought about you know, adding some sort of vision functioning brief questionnaire so that PCPs, when they go in, just like they might do a depression scale or something like that, just asking a couple questions about you know, how they're doing um, in terms of being able to manage their diabetes based upon their vision um, and the effect on the quality of life. And also things like nursing home intake forms. We're seeing a lot now of the forms really beginning to ask, you know, again, how is vision affecting you and whether it's causing some challenges with, with, um, with, with quality of life. Um, but I think as other, you know, eye specialists sort of examine and treat people with permanent vision loss, you know, from diabetes related eye disease, asking a couple questions, you know, are you having difficulty? You know, I always have a lot of retina uh, colleagues at myself. And so the, 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 the exam is they see lots of patients, little time, but just asking just a couple of questions like, are you having you know, problems performing everyday tasks, you know, because of your vision or how is vision affecting your quality of life? That will start the conversation going and then prepare patients for the next step. So whether it's referrals and resources, you know, for vision rehab for something like myself. And then, you know, if the doctor's team kind of ahead of time could have already prepared a list of local resources, even if it's like a local agency, like the Lighthouse or another agency, um, or be able to refer them to places like the National Eye Institute or Prevent Blindness, that would help people, I think, would, would go a long way. The idea, though, is, you know, to, to, to impress upon our patients and their families not to give up hope. I mean, vision loss and, and eyesight is a very important part of functioning. And we and want we people to know that you know, we're here for them and that families understand that they may have to tweak a few things um, and that other providers need to understand that as well. Yeah, we certainly, as you said at the beginning, just need to acknowledge as a care group that vision loss is a reality, unfortunately, and we need to continue to accept that and address it rather than, than ignore it. Um, so Ms. Nelson, would you share a little bit about the challenges that you've experienced coordinating your diabetes care and navigating the healthcare system? Sure. Um, everything that has been said has been awesome because dealing with uh, diabetes, dealing with vision loss is very important. In everyday life, you don't think, you know, at, at a certain age, okay, when honestly, when you think about vision loss, you probably think about somebody very older or things like that. Me being a young female, me having, um, being a wife, being a mother to two young boys, not thinking like, okay, I have to kind of navigate with how I do things outside because I may not have the vision like I had once before. So it's, it's kind of like, um, dealing with going through everyday life, working at my computer. Sometimes I have to pull out my magnifying glass, even at my computer screen to even look at words because sometimes the words are not there, you know, dealing with the loss of my uh, vision. But um, I have had many, many, many challenges. Uh, when COVID started, um, I wasn't able to go to my doctor's appointments like I should have. And um, I didn't take care of me like I should have. And sometimes I was putting my job before taking care of me, which was wrong because it ended up being in the situation that I'm in now. But um, the challenges in life has been very, very, very difficult at times, um, even driving at times. Sometimes it's kind of hard to, I mean, I can drive very well, but you know, I'm not out there on the road like I used to be at nighttime because I don't want to, you know, dang, in, endanger someone else or myself. Um, but everyday life, as far as eating right, um, and like like someone said previously, going out to walk. I mean, I love to walk my neighborhood. I love to go to the gym. I love to do different activities. But with certain vision loss, it's kind of like. I don't want to do that because I might fall. And then if I fall, then that's going to lead to something else. So it's different kind of things that I go through in a daily, daily life activity of just always wondering, okay, with this vision loss, now what do I do next? Um, it's always something different. But I mean, like I said, it, it has definitely been a battle, definitely a challenge, but it's definitely something that, you know, that I'm working towards with even getting better with 
every day when I wake up, it's, it's, it's a new day. And I'm grateful that I have vision because it was one point where I couldn't see anything at all, just complete blood in my eye. So it's, it's been definitely a battle, but something that I'm learning to deal with on a daily basis that it's, it's other people out there that go through this, but I'm not alone. That's right. Thank you for sharing. So Dr. Grant, what's your perspective on barriers to care and how that impacts care coordination and how we can overcome some of those um, barriers? Yeah, uh, so there are a, a lot of barriers um, to eye care, unfortunately, that uh, some of them were mentioned here today. And we like to sometimes think of these at different levels. So within the healthcare system, there could be barriers like we discussed earlier with the electronic medical records or maybe providers not talking to each other and having an easy way to communicate. Um, and then there's provider level, level barriers as well, which could be uh, time factors um, and things like that. And then at the patient level, there are you know, many things a patient will deal with on a daily basis, you know, attempting to, even if it's a person who is fully aware of their risk of eye disease, um, they could still, a lot of barriers that could be cost um, is one that's often brought up. Um, insurance coverage, and even if you do have insurance, knowing what is covered and what's not, and what your out of co um, pocket costs may be. Um, the time, you know, it's, it's time taken away from other responsibilities. Um, transportation, especially if you are someone who already has some level of vision loss, it might be more difficult for you to, um, to be able to go to your eye care provider. Um, and then there's also the fear, the fear factor of, you know, being afraid of what news you're going to receive and, and thinking that there's no um, you know, there's no hope and, you know, it's really not understanding. And then there are other, other issues about not understanding how uh, diabetic eye disease is, works and how it functions and that you really can't wait until you start noticing a problem and how important it is to, to see your eye care provider. And that doesn't just mean going to have a vision screening for eyeglasses, but it's someone who is looking into the back of your eye and really giving a, a, a comprehensive eye exam so that they can see what is going on and that you're returning back to the appointment on a regular basis. So there are a lot of, a lot of issues. Those are just a, really a few, but um, solution to a lot of these issues is what we've been talking about today, which is a coordinated care um, model. And that's because it really integrates the patient and the patient's needs into the eye care. And it, it allows the different uh, doctors to, you know, if a model that is effective and is working, um, it will, the care will be coordinated, it puts the patient uh, front and center so that um, all of the issues and the barriers are uh, noted and the team is working together to work around those barriers and then the care is accessible so that means financially accessible, it's in a location that's convenient that is you know fairly easy to get to within, within a reasonable time and then also that um, you know, certain things like it's culturally sensitive and the education that's provided is um, translating to the patient and they can, they can really understand what is happening with their eye care. So um, the more we pull together as a team, including eye care providers, uh, researchers, you know, kind of exploring what are the uh, different issues right now and what are the factors that we can, you know, further understand and then help build solutions around and then the patient family members working together as a team that's really going to um, eliminate a lot of these barriers. Yeah, that really emphasizes the need to come at, all, at this from, from all aspects. Um, Dr. Barnett, based on your experience and research, how can we improve information sharing among healthcare providers and between um, providers and their patients? Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Yeah, this is a pretty, um, this is another kind of deep topic that I think can take a lot of experience and can be quite tricky um, for both uh, doctors and patients. One thing I think is important to, one way to frame this is that coordinating care in many ways is really all about information sharing. It's about how do we, how do we um, connect information from one provider to another. It's also about maintaining and building relationships, but I think um, that can really be very hard to do. And sort of the base, um, the most basic thing we need to do is make sure that providers are working off the same understanding of what's going on with the patient, what's important to you, what treatments are you on, uh, what do you plan to do next, what have you done. 
So in terms of how can a patient, um, how can we improve information sharing in our very fragmented system where many providers are in silos on their own without time, ability, or payment to actually connect with others? Even though this should not be the job of patients, of, of those of you attending right now, I think that um, in our current system, there is a certain um, harsh reality that you are probably the most, you're probably the person who is going to be the most active and passionate advocate for coordinating your own care, as opposed to any single doctor that you have. And that um, while it's not, while I think it's unfair that patients bear some of that burden, um, it is, I think, entirely a patient's right to ask their physicians to talk with one another particularly if there's a confusion about what's going on. I, as a primary care doctor, unfortunately, one of, my, one of, one of the roles that I fill um, in most often for my patients is they actually can't reach a specialist. And they say, Dr. Barnett, can you please message my spine surgeon? I cannot get through their office. You know, like my back hurts again. I don't know what to do. Um, and um, one way to view that is as, a, as an administrative hassle but actually I view it as a core part of my job is really um, trying to um, connect the dots between the care that's going on. And um, I hope that all of you have the opportunity to find a doctor who's willing to um, pull together those threads in the healthcare system for you, because it's your right to have your physicians communicate even, even a little bit to one another, like very, very low bar here for um, actually sharing information. Um, two other um, much more practical points that I want to make is that um, it can be very helpful, particularly if your care is quite complex, to uh, try to make sure that your providers share a system where they have the same electronic health record. Um, that helps with information sharing, um, but it, it's not a guarantee that the doctor is going to read all the stuff that's happened before. Um, but without electronic um, health record sharing, um, it makes the task much, much harder. Um, the other thing is that many healthcare systems these days um, have a program called e-consults, which is something that I have um, I have studied myself. And this is basically um, e-consults is a system where um, a doctor can basically submit a question or an issue through like kind of a formal service for a specialist to answer. Like you know, I could say, you know, my patient, my patient thinks the eye drops are hurting her eyes. Like, what do we, what do we do? And I don't need the, I don't need the patient to go to her ophthalmologist to, to actually see and ask. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, so many of you are probably um, involved with health systems that have a system like that. And it's something you can easily ask your doctor and say, hey, you know, like, I wonder, you know, I've heard about e-consults. Is that a way we could contact a specialist? So that's my, I think those are, those are, those are some um, overall, those are some, um, a few tips uh, for um, bringing it together. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, so as we start to wrap up the initial part of this, Ms. Nelson, um, reflecting back on your experiences taking care of your diabetes in your eyes, what do you wish that you had known about diabetes-related eye disease that you didn't know before? That it could really take your eye vision. Um, I had a sister who passed from, um, she was on kidney dialysis, and it affected her kidneys. And the way diabetes affected my eyes, it just, it, it, it made me really, really dig deep into eye vision because it's like um, knowing that you can wake up one day like I did, just normal and living life like you usually do. And within that same day, you don't have any vision. And it just made me um, want to go back to evaluate a lot of my life of when I first found out from having gestational diabetes to having type 2 diabetes to even talking with doctors. And some doctors, you know, was willing to help and change medicine. Some, you know, said, no, this is what I'm used to working with and this is what we're going to use. And that's it. And my numbers stay elevated. But I, I just continued to keep trying and keep trying. But then when my numbers came down, then that's when everything changed. And it just made me appreciate life in general, um, even with my vision now. But um, I would really, really tell people to take care of yourself because when you take care of yourself, 
it not only affects you, it affects your family who's around you because they also have to be part of your care team at that point in time um, where um, I have a 14 year old and 12 year old where they were having to tell me, no, mama, don't go that way. You bumping into the wall or something like that versus um, my husband even having to help me out of bed to take me in certain parts of the house, even though I knew where everything was at. But it was just just the point of knowing when you have diabetes is best to take care of. I mean, from having a high number to a low number, that can mean everything. Um, following the doctor's orders completely, taking your medicine, exercising, eating right, all of that plays a big, big factor. And like, like everyone is saying, keep your doctors informed. Every doctor needs to be informed in, in your health care because one can say something that could, I mean, you know, you can be taking one medicine from one doctor and it could be working against you with another doctor. So if everybody is, you know, in cohorts with everything, then it could just be a big, big plus. So I would just say, take care of yourself. Um, follow every guideline that you can. Don't listen to what everybody else say. This was this what this has to work for you. And I'm a living witness to know that I should have done that and not worried about what everybody else had to say or you know it's 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 very important. Thank you. Well you you touched on a lot of this, but I'm gonna ask it anyway to the rest of the group um as final question. What advice would you share with the folks listening in today about taking care of themselves, their diabetes, and their eyes? Um, maybe I'll start with Dr. Primo. Sure. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, diabetic eye related disease and vision loss is the number one cause of vision loss and impairment in working age adults. Again, not something we really enjoy talking about, but it's a reality. And so um, I think what Ms. Nelson is saying is really take care of yourself and um, make sure that you know you get that annual dilated eye exam every year because prevention is a key. So if, if the doctors can, we can find the, the, any evidence of retinopathy earlier on, that's gonna be you know, better. And then I would just say, so finally that if, unfortunately you do suffer vision loss and become visually impaired, um, to please have hope and to seek help again, um, to really sort of speak up and be an advocate for yourself and for families to understand, you know, there may be different ways of doing things. Maybe as Ms. Nelson said, you may not be able to do the same things the same way, um, but you can still live a productive um, life and have a very, very good quality of life. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, seek out the resources, um, speak ups, whether it's networks on social media or, you know, other, other recommendations from our vision rehab team, but just have hope um, and know that there are resources out there to help you. Thank you. And what about you, Dr. Barnett? I guess one thing that I would say is that, um, you know, I, I see there's a question in the Q&A about diet, that um, managing diabetes can be very, very difficult. And I think it's really important to be kind to yourself because everybody has ups and downs. Um, you know, one thing I tell my patients who are trying to lower carbohydrates and sugar in their diet is that, you know, like our whole society is working against you to shove sugar into your, into your mouth. And if you walk into a supermarket and you closed your eyes and you just grab stuff on the shelves and put it into your cart, probably 80 to 90% of what you grabbed will have tons of added sugar into it, in it. And so, you know, we're all working against a system which is really designed to make it very hard to accomplish the things that folks with diabetes need to accomplish. And so um, I think I try my best to, um, you know, make sure that at least my office is not a place where there's, where there's shame around um, what, accomplishing what is a very difficult task. And that um, even though there's ups and downs, um, you know, you can get help and it's okay it's you know if you make mistakes it's 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 you know you're human and i don't want folks to feel discouraged because um because it's difficult but to just make one little step at a time that's such great advice and what about you dr wang yang Wu? anything to add to that i do i thought that was spot on and what i was going to say is that we see you you know this journey is not an easy one i really echo that there's a lot to do there's a lot to manage and so i want you to also be kind to yourself along that journey i would also say um that 
there is also opportunity to break generational challenges. This is not something that has to happen to you. If it happened to generations before you, it's not something that is inevitable. There is some self-determination or there is some agency, there is some power that you have in this process. And so I also want to say that out loud. And then lastly, I wanna echo Dr. Primo in saying, and there's also hope. And so if you haven't had anyone look at your eyes, don't be afraid to have them look because of what they might find. There's hope there. So if there's nothing there, there's hope. If there's something there and you've had an intervention in the past that maybe wasn't your favorite thing, I'm a retina surgeon, I get it. But there's hope on the other side of those things. And so I want you to know that engaging in care and engaging in some in care with someone that sees you and sees what's happening with you can push you to a different place and allow you to live your full self and push towards the path that will allow you to live the best life with the best vision possible for you. And so don't forget to work to seek that and find someone who will partner with you to do that. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Grant. Um, this is all really great advice that already came out. Um, I think to add to that, I would say to make a commitment to yourself that you're going to start um, the healthiest lifestyle possible. And that will mean, um, you know, everything that you're eating and all of the other actions to do, but also to take care of your eyes um, and then make a plan and a list of all the actions that you need to do to, to accomplish that because it is a lot and it's you're going to have times where you slip up and times where you feel really good about what you've accomplished and I think that's all normal and just to remember that um you know if you have a friend or a family member that could work with you that's great um sometimes we do have to walk the journey alone um but one thing that I would recommend to you is to try to do your part of building a relationship with one of your providers um and I know it could be difficult sometimes because you are doing, you could do your part and the providers, you know, sometimes don't do theirs, unfortunately. Um, but I would still try to continue with, um, you know, a provider. And then once you're to a point where you have someone that you trust and you know they're looking out for your health care, it really makes a, a really huge difference in how you're then navigating, you know, the healthcare system because you have someone on your side. And, you know, just remember there are many of us out here who care about your health and who want you to you know live a long healthy life and um just try to keep that in your mind even when you have bad experiences well thank you all so much and we do have some time for some questions if anyone has any please enter them in the q a button but we have quite a few already um dr wanyan we'll direct this first one to you uh, someone's asking if if once a patient has diabetes and starts maintaining a healthy a1c can this reverse vision issues or are vision issues permanent once they start? Good question. Certain things are reversible and they change, which is awesome to know. Um, so there is a term for this where we talk about kind of that environment in your body, which is the high blood sugars and the inflammation that we talked about and how long the duration of how long you've had diabetes and how long that control was poor really matters. And it matters to those blood vessels because that's the environment that they're in. But what we have found is um, improvement in blood sugar over time can decrease uh, macular edema. Sometimes you go through a little stretch where it goes up, but a lot of times if you can get it back, it can go down it can decrease the little outpouchings in the vessels that people will call mac, uh, microaneurysms or tiny little hemorrhages that are there. Um, something that I'll also say is that remember we talked about how long this has been happening. And so you'll hear some folks that will say, you know, before I went to the eye doctor, I didn't have any problems. I was doing great. And then they started doing things. And then now I have these big problems or I journeyed with someone else who had no problems. And then all of a sudden they had problems. So what I also like to say too, is that a lot of times if we get severe disease, that disease can be asymptomatic. And so I'm looking in and I'm worried, but you're looking out and you're 2020. And so what I usually tell people is that at that point, sometimes there's kind of this roller coaster and I'm trying to stop it and level it out. And there can be some more decline in vision before we get to stabilize you, unfortunately. So I guess the answer is twofold. Yes, there's some aspects that are reversible. Yes, there's some um, 
whenever we can get someone's blood sugar to the optimal level, we want them to do it, not just because of their eyes, but if you get to the point where you have uh, end stage um, or like proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you are also at higher risk for mortality from heart attack, stroke, heart failure, and other things that are the big vessel diseases as well. And so we are worried about you, not just because of your eyes, but we are worried about you and we are worried about your overall health. And so, yes, some of the things can go away, but some of the things persist even after we, we begin to treat them because of the changes that happened over time, which is why that message of kind of stick with us, stick with it, find somebody that you trust, and there is hope throughout the spectrum is really, really important. I mean, it also is lovely to hear stories like Miss Nelson's story because you want to hear the story of someone who has been through. And it's a very specific and can be very frightening journey. And so it's nice to hear someone that has gone through that so that when you go, you have a little bit of context as what might happen. But it's a very, very unique perspective. I think that's so important. We have a, have a program that kind of brings patients together um, and to create community. And too often people feel that they're alone and finding that they're not is, is so important to that. Be, yeah. hope to be a part of that journey. Um, Dr. Barnett, we've talked a little bit, it's, it's been mentioned, um, the term social determinants of health. Could you explain a little bit more about what that means to our um, viewers um, and, and share its impact on patients and healthcare? Sure. Yeah, so this is another one of those um, kind of catchphrases, kind of like patient-centered care that gets thrown around a lot. Um, so social determinants of health really is a kind of wastebasket term for everything that can influence health that isn't kind of directly under the purview of um, the healthcare system. So, you know, doctors, we take care of things like medications and we order tests and we give people diagnoses. Whereas um, in the social determinants of health, this is about the extent to which say somebody's housing costs are determining um, their access to medication or um, unemployment or, um, or, stress, or, or, or stress at home being a single mother. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's many, many other examples. Um, it could be language barriers, financial barriers, um, um, education barriers, health literacy, all these things that really kind of um, come into, um, uh, into the fore in helping someone manage their health, particularly diet, which is so critical for diabetes. We kind of lump into this issue of social determinants of health. And um, hopefully doctors are conscious of them because ignoring them means um, really, I think, uh, ignoring social determinants of health is probably one hallmark of care that is not patient-centered because everybody has some kind of social determinant of health, even if it's a good one. Um, and that's really, you know, it's, it's important that your provider appreciates your, your um, social financial um, 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 situation and how it affects your health. Isn't that really at the heart of what we do in public health is trying to create more of the good determinants and less of the bad ones? Right. Right. Um, I mean, like just one example, one example I think of just very briefly is like like a good social determinant of health is that you have um, you have a loving family member at home, caregiver, right? A spouse, uh, a grandkid, right, who really helps out with diet and managing medications and all that. Like that, that's a very that's a very positive social determinant of health. But there are many people that live alone and don't have that. And then that and and th there there's a there's a um, an example where the absence of a social relationship is really important for someone's health, and it's hard to create that as a doctor, but it's a very important context in helping someone manage their care. Thank you. Um, this next question, I, I think I'll direct to you, Dr. Primo, it probably impacts all of you, but I think because of your work, it, you might have a special interest or answer to this. Um, what did you find to be the primary challenges during the COVID pandemic in dealing and working with patients and how were you able to transcend those barriers? Well, you know, we had a tough time. I'll, I'll speak for um, my institution where we were literally closed for six weeks to routine care, if you will. And so we obviously were there for emergencies and very time sensitive kind of care, but we were close to routine care. And what that means is a routine care could be for the diabetics, it's for the diabetics and others who need to have that routine examination. And so unfortunately what we saw was 
people that had missed it and then got scared and kind of deferred it and didn't get around to it. And so then maybe a year or two later, you know, even as we're supposedly coming out of the pandemic, which we may or may not be, um, but they're still scared. And so what happens when you miss the routine care is that's um, what we've been talking about is that oftentimes those very, very early signs then aren't able to be detected early enough. And unfortunately, it puts people into um, later stage of the disease. Um, regarding some of my vision rehabilitation work, we really had um, some challenges. Again, most of my patients are more on the elderly side and so not wanting to come in and so, and then being afraid to go out because they couldn't see well. And so I think we had to figure out other ways to communicate that. That's been one of the good positive things about telehealth. It has its pluses and minuses, but one of the good things is that we were able to at least communicate with people and see how are you doing? You know, and even if you haven't been able to get out, is there anything that we can talk about in terms of um, devices or tools that maybe we can talk about and I can recommend something to you? And so I think, you know, the positives that it allowed us to maybe communicate a bit better and figure out um, more innovative ways, if you will, of communicating. But I know for the visually impaired and blind community in particular, uh, the pandemic was, and still is, has been very, very challenging and difficult um, because again, especially just think about wearing a, a mask. If, you, if you're encountering people socially and they're having a mask on, which they should have, um, but if they have a mask on and you don't see well, um, and you're trying to figure out a little bit what, what, what's going on. I mean, you can't see their faces, you can, may not be able to recognize them, all those sorts of things. So um, it, posed, it, it definitely posed some challenges for sure. Yeah, we certainly talked a lot, talked a lot about the challenges that healthcare faced in addressing the patient with COVID, but we often forget that people continue to have eye conditions and so many other health problems. And their care providers were definitely impacted as well. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. I'm gonna um, come, ba come back to where we started to the primary care, Dr. Barnett. Um, when incorporating vision impairment into primary care practices, um, what are the two to three questions that primary care providers should be addressing with, with their patients? Um, good question. Um, I, for, for my patients, what I'd say is um, in a way, kind of like hearing loss, um, I find that, you know, uh, vision, vision and hearing loss are both issues that can kind of creep up on people and it can be hard to admit that, you know, there's really a barrier there. Um, and I think it's really important for um, primary care doctors to ask about um, vision issues and again, sort of a, in a non-judgmental way or make it sound as if it's normal because often it is, right? That, you know, a lot of people have this. I wonder if it's something that you have. Um, and that I also, um, you know, certainly for diabetes patients, there's no question that they need to have um, annual ophthalmologic exams. Um, but it's also something that I think most older adults, even if their diabetes is well-controlled, um, should, should have as well. Um, another thing to be aware of, and this is a bit, a, a little bit, ten, a little bit of a tangent, um, but just because it's so common, I think um, another area of vision care that's very important is to make sure that anyone who is eligible um, to get cataract surgery um, sees an ophthalmologist and gets evaluated for a cataract procedure, um, because that is um, that is very easily treatable. It really gets in the way of vision impairment. Um, I don't know how much more common it is actually in patients with diabetes, but it's so common that it's um, um, that I think it's uh, important to not ignore. And there, there are large disparities by poverty, race, um, other, um, other factors in who gets access to them and who doesn't. Thank you so much. And thanks again to all of you for joining today. You know, eyes are such a remarkable organ that we have, but so much more remarkable are the people that house them. And, and I appreciate that we're all talking about that and the, the, making this patient-centered care um, so relevant. And, um, so for those watching, please do complete the evaluation survey that you'll receive after this. And the recording will be posted on the Prevent Blindness website in the next couple of days. Have a great evening.